Hello, this is Daryl Pillsbury from Marijuana Resolve. Vita couldn't be here today with us, but we are very happy to have a candidate for Vermont Lieutenant Governor, Cassandra Geekis, with us. Um, good afternoon, Cassandra. How are you today? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me here, Daryl. Well, it's a pleasure. And first, we're going to, I want to talk about some of your other issues, but since we are Marijuana Resolve um, and we know that you have a position on the decrim mm -hmm. side. So let's start right off with uh, what is your position for decriminalization of marijuana? I am 100% in support of decrim. I, one of the biggest issues that's really resonated with me around decrim is number one, the cost, the amount of money that we're spending on our corrections budget in the state. And number two, the fact that um, young people who are arrested and charged for carrying small amounts of marijuana are barred from federal student loan aid are barred from a whole host of federal programs. Um, it just, the, the punishments that we're enacting don't at all fit the crime. And uh, if in fact you believe it a crime, it, to be a crime, which I do not. Um, and I think it's just, it's time for our, our criminal justice system to move forward and focus on, on the actual crimes that are being committed and not waste money and time and resources, especially when when police budgets are tight, town budgets are tight, prosecuting, um, you know, people for, for small amounts of marijuana. And when I was in the legislature, I served on the Institution Corrections Committee. And at the time, when I left in 2008, it was on average $52,000 mm -hmm. to incarcerate somebody. And when you put in a person for a minor offense like marijuana, you have to release somebody else. Um, and that was one of the things that really struck me. Um, now, for me, I want to go all the way to legalization. Um, and I would like it based on the alcohol model mm -hmm. and tax and take that tax revenue, what I would like to do if, mm -hmm. it was, if I had the magic wand. Yep. I'd like to take 50% of the tax that we bring in, give it to the general fund. The other 50% goes mm -hmm. right to the health care program that yep. we want to implement. Um, so if you were a lieutenant governor, would you be willing to go even that far to absolutely having it uh, legal? Well, so I agree with you. I think that that's a great idea and I would love to see us get there. I think, so one of the things to know about me that's, that's important I think for voters too to understand is that um, when you're a leader and as lieutenant governor, I think it's very important to have a, a bold vision for where you wanna go. And I think what you just explained is a great vision for where we wanna go. Um, and then there's the practicality of what we can get done year to year. And one of the reasons why I want to be in the state house and I want to, to uh, work in the Senate is to try to, um, to make, make progress and do it faster. Um, now, I think we're in a great position. I mean, there's enough people, enough legislators, both on the Senate and the House side, and certainly the governor, that uh, want to see us move toward, um, toward decriminalization. And uh, I think that that is a great first step. I would love to continue to have conversations about legalization. It's, uh, you know, the tricky thing is there's lots of things we can accomplish in Vermont, and it's difficult mm -hmm. because of the federal, what's going on at the federal level. That being said, I am not at all afraid to push boundaries. I think that the situation that we're in, we can't sit around and wait for uh, D.C., even though we have a fantastic congressional delegation, to solve these problems, whether it's, uh, it's criminalization of, of marijuana or you know, rolling back those laws or it's universal health care, it's affordable child care. We can't sit around and wait for the, those problems to be solved for us. So Vermont really has to lead the way, and we have to do it in ways that are smart, that are practical and politically palatable year to year. But I think it's a really important, the a job of the Lieutenant Governor, they can play a really big role in working with the governor to set a bold vision for where we're going and, and really working behind the scenes during the session to build support mm -hmm. for, for those, those issues. And then the other parts of the year to be out there and be an ambassador to Vermonters, what we're talking about in the State House and bring Vermonters ideas back to the State House. So I think it's, it is the perfect job to talk about something like this. Um, and in this case, I think the governor is on the right track and we want to we wanna keep moving forward on that. Um, yeah, we're very happy with uh, Governor Shumlin's stance on uh, the decrim and even, even for, uh, you know, the passage of just having it, you know, legal. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's a good thing. Our, our biggest problem is on the House side with the Speaker of the mm -hmm. House, and we're going to try and work on that a little bit. 
Um, well, that's very good. Uh, now, this show is it's marijuana resolve, and, mm-hmm. and basically we we advocate for what you know we believe to be uh, an unjust <laughs> uh, cause. Right. Um, but since you are running for lieutenant governor, and um, you have a whole bunch of other things that that I would like to get out there to the public, mm-hmm. other than just the marijuana thing. Yeah. Um, and one of them, because because domestic violence is big on your list too. Absolutely. Uh, so one of the things I see as I work at the hospital, um, that's my regular job, mm-hmm. and and uh, alcohol brings in a lot of domestic violence. Mm-hmm. Whereas I don't see so much of that happening with marijuana. And I'm not sitting here, folks, and telling everybody domestic violence would go away if we let <laughs> everybody smoke pot. But uh, during prohibition, mm-hmm. one of the reasons why marijuana became the drug was they were pushing it on these men mm-hmm. who were couldn't have their alcohol anymore and uh, needed some way to mellow out. So, you know, I mean, it's it, there's a lot of reasons why, personally, I'd like to see mm-hmm. it. But anyway, let's get on some of your other issues, and one of them being domestic violence, mm-hmm. okay? Um, I see you were a big advocate for that. It's something that I see on a daily basis at the hospital. I tell people, although you can't really come to your local hospital, hang out for a weekend, but if you want to see what your community's like, mm-hmm. geez, do that. It's yeah. kind of amazing. Um, but anyway, let's talk a little bit about Absolutely. what you did as far as uh, your advocacy for domestic violence and, and what you've seen. And Absolutely. It's a, it's a huge issue, and I think it's, <laughs> it's one of the things that is still hidden from yep. light, although we've come a long way. <clears throat> with support for survivors of domestic violence and rehabilitation programs, which you know in some ways gets back to our discussion of our criminal justice system and, and what we're doing with people and whether we are in fact rehabilitating them. Um, but this has been a long-term commitment for me. It's It really started in college with my first women's studies class. And I think once I started to realize how often this was happening, um, and you know, there has been a lot of domestic violence in in my own family over time, um, not with my parents, but with grandparents and, and in mm-hmm. different parts of the family. So no one is immune to it. And it's, uh, and people are, because of the big psychological component of it, people, a lot of women who've experienced this or families who've experienced this um, find it difficult to talk about. Also, there's a big safety issue. So some of the work that I've done, I've not only worked with you know survivors of domestic violence, um, that was what I did for six or seven years. And then I really wanted to go to the other side of it. And I wanted to say, what are we going to do? How are we going to work with men to stop, to change this, um, for not only for their own um, families, but so they're not passing this on to their children, because children learn all of these yes, behaviors from a very young age. And I think that when we talk about alcohol or you know substance abuse, it does exacerbate domestic violence. But what I've realized over time is that it really has to do with people's, uh, with men's belief about women, about the role of that, of that partnership, what each partner's role is, and, and it has to do with their peers, who they're around, um, and a sense of power and control that they have over their partner. And so what we have to do is really um, work on changing beliefs. And that's not easy to do if, if you have a community or you have men who are surrounded by peers who are validating what they're doing. So when I, I spent three years working at the Domestic Abuse Education Project with uh, Spectrum Youth and Family Services in Burlington, and in, I did some shifts in Barrie, and it was a, I believe it's 27 week uh, mandated batter's intervention program. It was a group dynamic, so there were anywhere from 10 to 12 men in a room. It was myself and then a male co-facilitator, so we always had a gender balance, and we would you know, go through a curriculum with them for two hours every week for 27 weeks to try to get them to recognize behaviors because um, what you'll often hear is that, I just got so angry, I didn't know what to do. But we need to discuss all of the emotional abuse, the verbal abuse, the mental abuse, and the manipulation that comes long before um, there's ever actual violence. And, you know, the number of times that I've heard men, men say, well, I only had to hit her once. I mean, that's the kind of dynamic that we're, we're dealing with. It is not about that one violent episode. Um, and this is part of why it makes it so difficult for women to leave, not only practically or when they have kids, but they've been with a partner for that's the part I can't get ten years, telling them they're not worth anything and yeah. that no one will love them. And 
it's the psychological component that is so, so damaging. Uh, there's another part in there when I was reading, um, transportation, which mm -hmm. isn't a, an, uh, an issue that's brought up a lot, mm -hmm. but it's another one of those ones that I watch. Yeah. <laughs> we just had a small little issue here about uh, the school buses route changing, mm -hmm. and it hit one of our little areas where the people don't have cars and stuff. Mm -hmm. So go on transportation a little bit, because when I saw that, it really caught my eye. I'd like to hear what you have to say Absolutely. about that. Absolutely. Um, and let me just uh, finish up on the domestic violence Oh, sure, topic. I'm sorry. No I want to make sure you I want to make sure I answer your question. Very good. Um, is that it's, um, as I said, it you know, yes, anger and anger management techniques are really important, but this is about people's beliefs and how they fit into the community. And if you have a, a man or somebody's partner who believes that their their wife or girlfriend is somebody that they own, that they don't have empathy for around their beliefs about women, then unless that core belief changes, you're not gonna stop the violence and you're not gonna stop the emotional abuse. And I think what's, not only do abusers need training, but all of us in the community, because too often, we turn a blind eye to these situations and we may not see a physical physical violence but we might see an emotionally abuse emotional abuse or you know a dig here or there towards um mm -hmm. somebody and i think what would be great if we if we started to see men holding each other accountable and not being instead of validating and laughing at a joke or at somebody when they you know mm -hmm. put their wife in their place that they actually say something and and the efficacy of the program itself it, the reality is I mean, human beings are patterned. And if you spend 30 years um, uh, you know, believing a certain thing, if you grow up seeing domestic violence, um, you have a set of triggers, it's probably unrealistic for us to think that two hours a week for 27 weeks is gonna completely change that person's worldview, especially if they go back into that same community and then they're in the same peer group where their behavior is being validated. So the program itself had a very high recidivism rate. But I think it's still important that we are having those conversations in that mm -hmm. room. And what I would like to see is more investment in programs like that so that maybe we're spending more time or we couple it with it, it with individual counseling um, so that that's our best chance at actually solving this problem. And we definitely know that when we put people in jail, now batterers, I, you know, some of them are, you know, you need to be taken off the street. They should be held accountable for their actions in the legal system. But v jail often makes people more violent instead mm -hmm. of less violent. So. And it really rips the family apart, too, because even, you know, the children still, you know, look up to their dad. And, you yeah. know, but it all comes down to that single word of respect, man. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, it's it really huge does. in my respect, man. Respect for everybody. Absolutely. It's just, you know. Um, so thank that, you for that. Very I'm good. Now, that now very good. Well, that was. I'm <laughs> glad you finished up on that. I do that every now and then. I start thoughts come in and they pop in quick. We're in the same but <laughs> I definitely wanted to make sure that we did talk about Absolutely. transportation. And before we get to the big thing, yep. okay. But um, transportation. What are your thoughts on that one? So my work in transportation. I uh, have been working towards my master's degree in community development and applied economics at UVM, and I was a uh, research fellow at the Transportation Research Center. I went back to grad school because I've been an advocate behind the scenes for 10 years now. And at the time, I realized that my heartstrings were pulled by a lot of issues. Um, good. Which is a good thing. <laughs> but that doesn't necessarily lead you to solutions. No. And it doesn't hold weight with some of the people we have to convince. So I went back to school because I wanted the economics and the statistics to be able to back up what I'm, what I'm doing and what I'm fighting for and the the challenges and the opportunities that I see both for us in Vermont and you know the rest of the country. And I decided to specialize in transportation because you know the main reason I did that actually was before I left I went to grad school. I spent two and a half years working at what is now Hunger Free Vermont. And I was working on um, federal nutrition programs, specifically the food stamp program. And one of the things that I did was I ran 20 focus groups in Washington and Chittenden County with low income mothers and talked to them, asked them what their biggest barriers were to putting food on the table. And time and time and time again, transportation came up and access to grocery stores. Um, yep. And, you know, we had regularly heard stories of women who were either walking miles to the grocery store with kids in tow, or they would get on the bus with three kids, they would go to the grocery store, 
they would call a cab to get back home because they have all their groceries yep, and that costs $35, which is a huge amount for people living yeah. in poverty. Uh, not only that, but if you can, you can only do that once a month. I mean, you can't, if you have a car, if you have money, you're going to the grocery store. The average person goes almost once a day. Um, but what happens is they're only going at the beginning of the month. They get their food stamps. It changes the dynamic of the food that you can buy. I mean, you can't buy a month's worth of fresh fruits and vegetables. Yep, very good um, point. You know, or they're going to go bad, or you're just going to buy a small amount. I mean, we also have to deal with how expensive they are. But if so many people don't... I started just to realize how interconnected all of this was. And so my passion is really looking at things systemically. And I know that that's prob that even that word is probably interesting to me only. <laughs> but I think that, you know, in a, in we're paying taxes. Our taxes should go towards supporting infrastructure towards supporting systems that really make it possible for working families to thrive and to prosper and that is the essence of my campaign here and that is the essence of the work that I want to do as lieutenant governor so I jumped at the chance to work on transportation because I realized well this is a big barrier for people for low-income people having access to healthy food um, and uh, so while I was there, the bulk of my time was spent on one on, in one-on-one -on -one interviews mm -hmm. and, uh, and some data analysis um, on how low-income mothers spend their time. So I was using a 24-hour time diary and then individual interviews. And my interest was really looking at how access to transportation, a car specifically, impacts the quality of life of low-income mothers. And what I found was fascinating, and so fascinating that I'm still working on it. So well, I'm there's hoping probably a lot that in of December um, to, to finish that, that study up. But um, the, I realized that access to transportation also impacts all of, the, all of these other areas of quality of life. We tend to think about our transportation system in terms of, here's a bus that gets somebody to and from work. If we're lucky in Vermont, here's a bus that gets somebody to and from the grocery store. It doesn't help families be well-rounded or healthy no. because if it's a Sunday afternoon and you want to, you know, not, you don't want your kid to sit in front of the TV. You guys want to go out and do something together. There's mm -hmm. no bus service. Mm -hmm. So it impacts kids learning, kids development, the whole family socialization. Are they going to go to the library and read books? Or are they going to stay home and play video games. Um, there's this whole host of activities that these families are, are really left out of. Um, and just the sheer time that it takes if you are living at the poverty line to get to every appointment that you need to in yeah, order to yeah. get your benefits. So if you're a single mother, you know, you have to go to um, the Department of Children and Families office. You may have to go to the Social Security office. You have to get your you to the doctor, your kids to the doctor, childcare. I mean, when is there time to look for a job? When is there time to work? Mm. And much less get to a job. One of the first things they're going to ask you on a job: Do you have a car? Exactly. If you don't, you probably you may not get hired. Yeah, and if you're if you're getting paid hourly. If you step out the door to take your kid to the doctor and you miss three hours because you can't just jump in your car and yep. zip back and forth, you're missing three hours of wages. And it's something that a lot of people who are on salary or have cars that we take for granted. Oh. Um, two, so. two quick points. One is mm -hmm. I love the Good News Garage because yeah, of that. Yeah, they're amazing. Okay? Uh, that was one of the things I made sure we funded in the early 2000s. And the other thing, my daughter who did not have a car, she went to Champlain College, mm -hmm. graduated. Um, I let her have my car. Mm -hmm. Her life changed totally so by just good. having a car. And she's a young girl that, you know, she could get around fairly yeah. easy, didn't have a family. So transportation, when I saw that on there, I was really mm -hmm. neat that you took that as an issue. Absolutely. Because it's one of the ones that I've always felt very important about, but it wasn't one of the key ones because there's so many out there. But I was really happy to see that. Now, we're going to get on, oh, well, here we go, uh, Clean Energy Solutions, I see, is another pivot. good one, okay? Mm -hmm. um, of course, you know... One of the things, Cassandra, is you're hitting all the things that I'm for too, and, and probably most Vermonters seem to be just how you're going to get there. That's exactly. the difference. So let's talk about some clean energy solutions. Um, what I'm, I imagine you worked somewhere in that, so yes. let's let's talk a little bit about that. I, I can't believe you're 30 years old, <laughs> college graduate, 
And you've been, so far, your life, and that's why it's good that it pulls at your heartstrings because mm -hmm. it's giving you the drive you need to do what you're Absolutely. doing. I mean, you're advocating for a lot of things out there, and um, and that's good. Okay, Thank you. And that's really good because um, one of the reasons I first got into politics, I didn't even mean to, it just happened, mm -hmm. because I had a big mouth and I cared about things. And you can do so much Absolutely. for what you believe in mm -hmm. when you have that door open, you know. So keep it up good job let's go on to clean energy solutions absolutely and so it's interesting that uh, i appreciate <laughs> me. you bringing that up and what i will say i don't i can't actually explain why but this is something that has been this kind of work is a lifetime commitment for me and it, it is the reason why i'm on this earth it's the reason why i'm in vermont i'm not saying there's divine intervention in it i'm just saying this is absolutely what calls me okay keep and, your thoughts yes. okay because i don't want but i got to say this too mm -hmm. you know that right there, mm -hmm. okay, is is what makes you, okay? It's been my long life. I'm 56. Mm -hmm. I've been helping people as much as I could. Mm -hmm. And believe you me, it's the best way to go. It is. Okay? It's... Because every time you can help somebody, it's a beautiful thing. I agree. Go. And, and you know, I grew up, uh, my mother grew up in Italy at the tail end of World War II. And you do she, look a little Italian. Yeah, I'm Italian and Greek. <laughs> um, so I'm fiery too. Yeah, I'm good. Um, but she, you know, she grew up in extreme poverty. I mean, no shoes, no school clothes, mm -hmm. no, no, no Christmas presents. I mean, they were lucky. To, she tells me a story about getting an apricot for Christmas and how excited they were about that. So when she came to this country, it was very important to her to instill a sense of gratitude in her children. And that is something I really appreciate. So I grew up with a sense, even though we were lower middle class, that just the fact that I had a roof over my head and a refrigerator full of food was an incredible privilege. Mm -hmm. And I was a voracious reader. So I, I was reading right away on what was happening in other parts of, of the world. And I got my start as an environmental activist at 12 or 13. This is what I, what I cared about. Um, you know, I read a book on factory farming actually when I was 11 and became a vegetarian. You know, I, I don't know, it's just always been there for me. Um, and you know, I think so the bulk of my work more recently has been around family economics economic security, but renewable energy, um, doing something about climate change, this is about our future. And mm -hmm. um, there is, you know, a perspective in which none, none of every of what everything else we're doing matters if 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 the earth is in a place where we can still That's live. Exactly I mean right. so and I don't care what you want to call it and who you think's doing it. it we got a problem. Matter. Exactly. <laughs> okay. Why keep it going that way? I don't care if it's a cycle whatever whatever we can do to slow it down Absolutely. or stop it i mean i get scared every time i look at greenland uh, the ice shelves i mean it's a it's and crazy the droughts in the midwest oh. the starving cows and the farmers oh, raising awful. their cornfields i mean it is it's devastating and, and the flooding i mean we're coming up on we're the one year anniversary of irene and wondering i think we're all wondering is this something that we're going to see more of and and so there's a couple pieces here i mean one is that we just have to prepare. I mean, we have to look at uh, what we're doing through Agency of Natural Resources and downtown development and those sort of things so that Vermont is as protected as it can be and families and businesses that are protected as they can be um, from more flooding or, or natural disasters. But again, this is where I think Vermont, one of the, another reason why I love Vermont is because we don't wait around for DC, Washington DC to solve our problems. We take the lead. And every time we take the lead on an issue and we show that it not only works and makes things, you know, contributes uh, positively to our state and the world, but quite often it's a boon to us economically. It's a boon to quality of life. It makes people want to live here. Um, and I think renewable energy fits right into that that paradigm. So what we need to do and what we're already doing, and you know, I credit the governor with this again, and and a lot of activists. I mean, there's so many people in the state working on this, and it, I you know, I take heart in that, and uh, that we are working towards leading the country in renewable energy. And um, I know that there's a lot of controversy out there right now about wind and solar, but the bottom yeah, line, yeah, you <laughs> we don't good. even need to go there if you don't want to. <laughs> but the bottom line for me is that Excuse me. All, all of us, although there are some Vermonters living off the grid and I applaud them for doing that, but our biz most vast majority of businesses and the mass vast majority of Vermonters walk into their homes or walk into their business, they flip on the lights, may turn on the TV, they you know will turn on the heat or whatever it is. We all use electricity. Mm -hmm. 
we wouldn't be having the show taping if we weren't using electricity. And nothing comes for free. Not energy, not healthcare, not any of this. Yep. So what we really need to do is be making deliberate decisions about where our energy is going to come from as long as we want to continue to turn on our lights. And everything has trade-offs. And it's a matter of looking at the scale of those trade-offs. And to me, renewable energy investing in that is a no-brainer. Um, when I think about... We're actually behind a lot of other countries, which just are. kills me. We really are. And when I think about, you know, people will often ask me about Vermont Yankee or nuclear power and say that it's clean. And, and I chuckle when I get that question for one reason, <laughs> although there's many reasons we could talk about yep. energy and BY and why that plant should be shut down. But human beings, we're not perfect. None of us. I love us. I love all my fellow human beings, but we're not perfect. And I don't think we can be trusted to store anything for 2,000 years to avoid <laughs> nuclear fallout. So to me, that's a no-brainer. Why would we do that? Um, and so solar, um, uh, wind, I think some hydro, um, some biomass. I mean, we can put these things together in a way. I mean, there's no silver bullet is the other thing. But in we a way... the hydro. Yeah. That was awful. Were you here for that by chance? I was. It might have been just when you were first. I was here, but I was working on nutrition issues. Oh, yep, yep. <laughs> um, but I think that it's there's no silver bullet, and the American way for a long time has been a one size fits all. Let's find one solution, and let's you know, uh, let's make it the huge solution to everything, and that's been fossil fuels. But we need a combination of energy sources and. We need to continue to have discussions around the state, but we need to keep moving forward together. And one of my interests as Lieutenant Governor, though, is making sure that communities who are being impacted by renewable energy projects um, have their chance to be heard, uh, particularly before the Public Service yeah. Board. There are some interesting models in other states yeah. of, of dedicated consumer representation. Um, and people, I think it's important that people feel heard and I think that may be the most important piece of the puzzle, actually, that they get to weigh in and they feel respected and like they're not being railroaded, even if they disagree with the outcome of the decision, because ultimately we have to keep moving forward to our to a clean energy future. And I think we're going to get there. And as lieutenant governor, I will continue to help us get there. I hope we get there. It's been something I've been talking about for 20 years. Yeah. Um, now for the last issue, which is a big one mm -hmm. uh, for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, it's something that actually started me on the road to politics back in 1992. Healthcare. Absolutely. I've been one of the lucky ones. I work at a hospital. I got great health care. This mm -hmm. ain't about me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's about a lot of my friends, neighbors, things like that. I mean, I find it absurd that we're the only country in the world where you can lose everything you work for because of your health. You know, it's crazy. But Governor uh, Shumlin um, said that uh, you are a leader in health care which I think is good coming from the governor. Um, why would he have made that uh, comment? Is that another one of your big... Uh, it is. So let's talk a little bit about Excellent. that and what you believe and um, give us a little bit about Absolutely. your healthcare scene. So this is healthcare and Vermont's efforts in moving toward healthcare reform is really what I've been, what's been, I've been focused on 100% for the past three years. As I finished up grad school, I, I saw a, an, a job opportunity at VPIRG as a healthcare advocate, and I knew a little bit about where the state was headed, and I jumped at the chance to go do this work uh, for a couple of reasons. One is I really wanted to be closer to, to lawmaking, and two, healthcare again. So if I say, okay, I worked on nutrition and realized that transportation was a piece of that, or I worked on domestic violence and realized that nutrition and transportation was a piece of that, healthcare I re even through all that other work, I realized I felt like I was just nibbling around the edges because the healthcare crisis is huge in this mm -hmm. country. And as you said, it's a financial health and well-being. Um, actually, the one of the most incredible stats to me is that 60% of bankruptcies in this country yeah. occur um, to families who have health insurance because of medical bills. So in Vermont, yeah, there you go. You're not immune even if you have health care. Nope. So I mean, it is. It's staggering. 200,000 people in the state, 200,000 
are either uninsured or have insurance whose coverage is so low that they can't afford to get the care that they need. Mm -hmm. And with the healthcare budget of $5 billion and growing, that makes, I mean, we're clearly doing something wrong. Especially when we only have 600,000, exactly. 640,000 people in the state. Exactly. So um, my role <clears throat> at VPIRG was really um, in the state house and then on the ground in communities. So, and it was nuts and bolts on healthcare. I really have become an expert on healthcare because not only do I believe in single payer, publicly financed healthcare, I, I see the pathway that, to get there. And I think the governor again has us on the right track. Oh yeah. And there's a lot of support for it in the in the legislature, especially in leadership. Um, but what I and, and healthcare was the main reason that I decided to run for lieutenant governor because I want to make sure we stay on the right track. But my role, um, I, I did work closely with the governor at at VPIRG was not only to help uh, be a leader and help pass the past two years of healthcare reform pieces of legislation. But I also really consider myself a watchdog uh, for consumers and patients. And it's something, you know, I'm the type of person who by day I'm out there talking to Vermonters about their experiences and by night I'm reading 400 pages of insurance company and over four. So, um, well, you'll like the legislature then because <laughs> exactly. the stuff you got to read, man, although exactly. you've already probably seen yep. a lot of it. Actually, last year I was uh, the bill that I'm one of the bills I'm proudest of that I worked on I this past to get to year. That, so that's good. Is a bill on denied claims. So, this started for me uh, last December. I real, you know, every time I was out there, I heard stories from people who kept saying, <clears throat> I got a denial letter from my insurance company and I don't understand why. You know, I went in and had surgery and I got a bill for $1,200 because my the anesthesiologist was out of network. How is that possible? And just the sheer number of hours that people were spending trying to fight these claims or hitting a point in which they were so stressed out because they're sick, which is not yeah. the best time to deal with bills, right. um, that they were being called by collection agencies and yeah. constantly by the hospitals. And so I, I thought to myself, I wonder how often this is happening. So I start doing research and realize we have no idea. There are only, I want, I want to say six states, if my memory serves me correctly, six states in the whole country that collect some portion of data on how many claims are denied, but very little. Vermont collected no data at all. So from my perspective, there was no way for us to, number one, see if there are patterns in denial so that we could fix it. I bet it. there definitely is. So because that could, that's one yeah. of their, that is a, that's what they use. Mm -hmm. They're hoping that that elderly person or whoever won't get on a phone and fight that. Exactly. So, um, and, and if we saw the patterns at the state level, we could fix it before somebody has to spend six hours on the phone. Um, so we weren't collecting any of the data and that was my mission for this past year. And actually had, this, I, you know, work really well with both Democrat, well, all three parties, four parties, if you call independents a party, but um, I do. You do. So independents, uh, progressives, Democrats, Republicans, actually two Republicans and a progressive signed on to that bill. And it was hard work, but we passed that legislation with only one vote, no, no vote on the House floor. And well. it is the most progressive uh, and aggressive insurance company disclosure legislation in the country. So it requires that insurance companies report all of the number of claims they deny by category. And it also includes a whole host of other information. So how much the insurance company is paying their CEOs, their board members, how much they're spending on marketing. Was that a voice call? Was that a voice no, vote was a or was it a roll call? call? And only house. one person didn't vote for it? Yep. Was that Duncan Kilmartin? No, it was actually Tom Burke of West Rutland. Oh, wow. Um, huh. And so... Uh, Sorry, and, Duncan. Yeah. All of that information is public. Yeah. It's going to be on every state health care website and come out every year, and it's a part of their annual report, so it's certified as accurate. Well, that's huge. It's huge. Um, and I think it speaks to me of of two things. One is, this, this is one of the reasons why I'm so supportive of single-payer, because... Um, what you said about this, the numbers game. The way I started to think about it was... It was like, there was a time where you would go into Best Buy and a TV would be on sale and you would buy it. Well, the companies figured out that if they made you do a mail-in rebate, 
they would make more money because there's a certain percentage of people That's exactly right. that never mail the piece of paper in or you never you lose the gift card when it comes in the mail. I mean, they are doing the numbers behind the scenes. Mm -hmm. And so I can't sit here and say that that's what insurance companies in Vermont are doing. I can say there's evidence of this happening in other states. We won't know until we look at the data. But we, it is the job of elected officials and state agencies to make sure that that is not happening. And when it comes to insurance, insurance is run like a business, yeah. whether you're for profit or nonprofit. And when it's run like a business, that means you look at your bottom line and you want to maximize the amount of money coming in and minimize the amount of money going out. When you apply that to insurance, that means you want as much in premium dollars and co-pays and deductibles as possible. And you want to pay for as little care as possible because you are looking at your bottom line. So this is a fundamental problem. Mm -hmm. And this is, this is something that you know every other industrialized country has already seen, and this is why they have a different system of buying insurance. Well, that's because the first thing I say for people when we <clears throat> argue about healthcare issues is my first question is, do you believe healthcare should be based on a market-based system? Mm -hmm. As soon as they say yes, I'm done. I don't even talk to them anymore about it because they think that it, it is a, that's what it's all about. I can't believe... If you get rid of the middleman, we're going to save so much money so much right money. off the bat. It's unbelievable. Yep. Um, so anyway, I'm on with you on that one yeah. too. And I think people are swingable. <laughs> when you talk to them about it in that way, I mean, everybody has a a husband or a wife or a daughter or, or a mother or a father. So we have to, and I struggle with this too, we have to take this discussion outside of just policy and mm -hmm. politics and talk about the actual impact on families and people get that well one thing i don't do anymore i don't call it single payer because everybody gets nervous mm -hmm. i call it self-insured because then business people yep. understand what you're talking Absolutely. about and that's what we're talking about we're talking about the state of vermont being self-insured which will save us a, a lot of money in the long run i believe and medicare i also just say that People at Medicare at its core, leaving Part D aside, yeah. um, is a single payer healthcare system. Mm -hmm. The so um, is the VA. Exactly. Please, I and mean, so, are you kidding me? We do all sorts of uh, exactly. systems that are, you know, and, Social Security. Yeah. I mean, come on. So we want it Medicare. can be done. We want <laughs> Medicare for all, and we know how to do it because we're already doing That's it, right. and it works. Yep. Well, very good. Um, okay, I'm going to give you the last couple minutes here. Talk about something that um, you'd want to get out to the public or the voters or something. Go ahead and, and you've got a couple minutes to go. Thank you. Um, so thank you again for having My me pleasure. here. And, and thank you all for, for watching and listening. You know, what I want to say to finish up, because I think we've answered, I've answered a lot of questions, is that I am absolutely committed to being the next Lieutenant Governor of Vermont and will work as hard as I can to move us forward on critical issues. And for me, this is about families. This is about the family prosperity, family economic security, and, and we need to start looking at, at the big picture here. So it's not just that families need that a, a, a member of a family has to have a job. We need to have affordable child care. We need to have health care. Um, we need to, to make sure that we have energy efficiency in homes so that people can afford their heating bills. There's a whole host of issues around this that we have to tackle. And I want to make, make those uh, discussions, put those discussions at the top of the agenda as Lieutenant Governor. The Lieutenant Governor's role is, is really important. And I think, um, Sometimes, you know, we forget that Montpelier is a little bit of a bubble. So there's two things here. One is the lieutenant governor's job is to preside over the Senate. In that capacity, I will do everything I can to, to help move legislation forward that Vermonters care about, to make sure that uh, initiatives like decriminalization of marijuana, that death with dignity, um, the ability of child care workers to collectively bargain get their fair day on the Senate floor and get a vote because that's what Vermonters have legislators in there for. That's one piece. Um, the second piece is that the Lieutenant Governor is one heartbeat away from the Governor's office. Mm -hmm. It is absolutely critical that the person in that position shares the values and the goals and the vision of Vermonters. And when it comes to where I stand on issues, that is crystal clear. Um, and, you know, my mind is open to information going forward. You won't see me, you know, absolutely stick to something ideo ideological, but I want to be a voice of Vermonters in, in the State House. And it is critical that if 
needed if need be if the lieutenant governor steps into that role that they will keep us on the right track where we're on the right track and that they will continue to move us forward on places that we could be doing better and that is a promise i can make to all of you right now the third piece of it is that the other six months out of the year there is an incredible opportunity to be doing more with the office of lieutenant governor it is a taxpayer funded position it has a small budget it has a staff person so when I talk about affordable child care, for instance, that is something as soon as this, the, le the, the legislative session in 2013 is over and we're done working on the next, the next piece of health care, I want to bring um, the right people into the room, experts from Vermont, parents, child care providers, people from out of state to, to talk about affordable child care because this is a huge issue. I hear about it constantly on the campaign trail. And, and come up with a roadmap for how the state can be supporting affordable childcare. So that in 2014, when we walk into the legislature, the hard work of, of research, of policy roadmap, of some consensus building happens before we even walk in that door. And you know, it's not the lieutenant governor's role to, uh, to dictate policy. It's to bring the people together and to do the big picture thinking and certainly we'll work with the governor on that we'll work with uh with senators and representatives across party lines state agencies to every single um moment outside of the session i will continue to work full time so that we move forward on these issues all of those things combined i think makes me uh excited about this opportunity um and and the right person for the job and i would love to work with all of you to, to make sure that we, we achieve victory in November and that I get the chance to continue to serve you as, as Lieutenant Governor next year. So how else? Give us some of the information where you can be contacted. Uh, you must have a website or I something. Do. Okay, what is that? I do. So, and I'll be down, uh, down in the southern part of the state a lot. So if you see me, feel free to stop and talk to me. I'll be, I'll be around a lot. Um, but you can get in touch with us in a few ways. My website is www dot geekus 2012.com so it's g-e-k-a-s um, you can get in touch with us you can sign up for our email list right there my policy platform is up there videos and, and information on where we're going to be um, we also have a facebook page that it's facebook backslash geekus 2012 we have a twitter feed of course <laughs> which is at geekus 2012 so you can start to see the pattern emerge here um, but uh you need all that in today's world see i i don't have any of it <laughs> i just call me on the ha my house phone and that's where that's as far joe well joe does isn't here today he gets on me all the time over that yep. well um and my email else? address i should say yes my first name dot last name at gmail.com so Let's say your first name yes again, cassandra dot geekus at gmail.com i have an open door policy you know i'm working hard but would be happy to talk to you anyone from our staff would be happy to talk to you feel free to reach out let me know you know what you want me to be working on where you want me to be what i can do for you and and i will keep you up to speed on on what i'm doing on the campaign trail and what i'll be doing next year how you sleeping sleep <laughs> yeah you know vermont's bigger than you think isn't it <laughs> when you're going all over the place man it's unbelievable and especially when you get on uh, places where we don't have the interstate mm -hmm. oh my, my very God. dear friend uh representative paul Poirier from barry city uh one morning you know he wanted me to meet him in barry at 7 a.m and uh, paul i'm tired and he's he just said to me Cass, you can sleep after november 6th yeah so there you go and you probably will you know you probably will well listen thank you so much for coming down thank here and talking much. with us we really appreciate I that appreciate it um well everybody uh there you go uh, uh look into the candidacy of cassandra geekus for vermont lieutenant governor i hope that you enjoyed this show um a lot of information very well presented you really you. you really uh speak very well to tell you thank the truth you. kind of bums me out a little bit. <laughs> I'm, I'm more of a, poo -hoo, you really got it down good. Uh, listen, so for Marijuana Resolve, for Vita Crochetta, and Roland uh, up there in the booth today, thank you, Roland, for stepping in and thank making sure this uh, show went off without a hitch, I may add. And for um, Vita Crochetta, we thank you for watching. We'll see you next time right here on Marijuana Resolve. Cassandra, very good. Thank very you. Very well done. And let me tell you something, man, you're, you, you hit all the stuff I do.